In the late 40s, uh, as I was saying, there was um, a very charismatic evangelist. And um, he kind of came onto the scene, if you will, uh, in what was known as the Crusades of Los Angeles. Uh, they had originally scheduled three weeks for this, this young evangelist to, to come in and preach. And he showed up with a uh, kind of a pistachio looking suit with a flaming red tie and uh, he spoke with an accent that you would immediately know he was born and raised in North Carolina and here he is in, in Los Angeles uh, preaching a crusade well needless to say his sermons were very powerful he was very anointed and uh, by the time they got a couple of nights into this first week it was uh, standing room only. And then it went to overflowing capacity outside of the tent. Needless to say, they had to extend the crusade. It went like past eight weeks. And that was unheard of. Shortly after that, um, crusades started uh, popping up that he was preaching at. And they were drawing thousands and thousands and thousands of people. People coming from everywhere to hear uh, God's word being spoken through this young evangelist. His name was Billy Graham. And you know the story. Well, there was another young evangelist that was even more so anointed and his sermons even more so powerful. He preached in the first century. And just like Billy, he showed up in different kind of clothing. And just like Billy, he talked differently than the other folks talked. He ate differently than the other folks ate. But he was anointed, and he began to preach. And people came from everywhere to hear this preacher. And his name was John the Baptist. Uh, it's interesting to me that uh, John the Baptist, the, the, the cousin of Jesus, uh, was called by Jesus um, the greatest man ever to live. In Matthew eleven eleven, he says, Truly I say to you, among these born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. This is the same John that uh, his mother, who was, was barren, Elizabeth was her name, and the father, Zechariah, who was a, a priest, they were elderly. She got pregnant. And six months later, Mary gets pregnant with Jesus, and Mary goes to see Elizabeth, and as Mary comes up and gets close to Elizabeth, John actually flipped in her belly he knew Jesus was there John came to this earth with a purpose and his purpose was to pave the way was to point people to the coming Messiah Jesus Jesus and that's exactly what he did he began to preach repentance and baptize people of all things I guess he was considered the original Baptist, I would say. Such a powerful message that he had, such a, uh, an important purpose that he had in life. And Jesus called him uh, burning and shining lamp in John 5, 35. He says, he says that uh, John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp Lamp and, and, and what would you think he would mean of that? Well, a more correct translation, I guess, or literal translation of that would be that, that John the Baptist was a wick on a candle. You see, it's the wick that burns. It's the wick that brings the light. But as the wick burns, as it is used, it gets consumed. The same thing with John the Baptist as he was used, he shone his light brightly 
But his message about Jesus completely consumed him as he preached about the coming Messiah. John's ministry was over and Jesus' ministry started. And just out of the gate, Jesus began performing miracles and began preaching with such great authority and, and crowds began to come and and, and follow after him. And, and we've gone through quite a bit of that already in the book of Mark, how, how thousands and thousands of people would come and they'd flock around Jesus just to hear him talk and, 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 and just to see him perform these miracles. And word began to spread very quickly about this man named Jesus. But unless you had actually experienced Jesus, you really didn't know who he was or what he was about. Word traveled very quickly. And there was a, a tetrarch. His name was Herod, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. And um, he ruled in Galilee from 4 BC until he was banished in uh, 39 AD. And like, like all of the Herods, Herod Antipas was, was mean. He was, he was uh, wicked. He was a cruel tyrant of a man. When Herod heard about this popularity of this man named Jesus, he began to kind of somehow or another think that maybe, just maybe, John the Baptist had come back to life. Herod knew of one person who had such great popularity and such great charisma, and that was John the Baptist. And, and so there's this mystery about who Jesus is. And we're going to see today how Herod deals with the mystery of who this is and, and how he deals with the memory that he has of John the Baptist. Let's look now at the scripture, beginning with Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Mark chapter 6, 14 through 29, beginning with verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miracles, miraculous powers are, are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for the nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now let me remind you once again, this is, this is the truth. This is God's word. God's word. So let's start by uh, looking at verses 14 and 15. How... Herod remembers John the Baptist. It begins in verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. 
heard of what? And if we back up just a little bit, we see uh, time and time again how Jesus had healed people, just all kinds of of sickness and diseases. It didn't matter. Everybody brought everything they had to him, and, and he healed all of the sicknesses, all of the diseases. He did all kinds of miracles. He proved that he had authority over the wind and the rain and the waves. Jesus was becoming very popular, and Herod heard of it. And some people began to say, you know, well, it's Elijah or it's one of the other Old Testament prophets. But Herod, be, being, uh, I think, um, somewhat convicted over what had happened to John the Baptist, knew in his own heart that this person they were talking about, this, this Jesus that they were talking about, was John the Baptist, who come up out of the grave, who had been resurrected, Again, or at least that's what he had in his mind that was going on. And so for many reasons that we'll discover here in a minute, Herod was, was haunted by this memory of John the Baptist and what had happened. And what had happened. Uh, it was sad. And that's why Herod said to Jesus, said of Jesus, I'm sorry, in verse 16, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead I think in his own mind, he's trying to make good of the things that he had engaged in that resulted in the death of John the Baptist. And so let's look quickly at, at the events that led up to his murder. The first thing is that John, uh, John gets put in prison. In verse 17, it said, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. Herod put, put John in prison because he publicly denounced this marriage between Herod and Herodias. You see, Herod had visited his brother Philip, and Herod became enamored with Philip's wife, Herodias. And so they concocted this scheme that Herodias would come and visit Herod, and they got married. And John, boldly, as he always was, approached the king and told him, this is morally wrong. This is sinful. You should not be married to Philip's wife. And so Herodias gets absolutely mad about it. Herod is somewhat mad about it. And Herodias wants him dead. And so John is put in prison. Instead of, instead of Herod killing him, he put him in prison. In verse 18, you see again where uh, Herod was, was there and John came up and accused uh, the two of them because they were married to each other. You go, what kind of boldness would that have taken for somebody to approach a king and say, in his face, so to speak, this woman you're married to, you shouldn't be married to her because she's your brother's wife. Well, you approach a king and get in his face like that, most of the time they would kill you. They would have you put to death. But there was something about John that Herod found intriguing. And so he kept him alive. He put him in prison. And, and at this point in time, in the, in the story, we find that John has been in prison about a year after his ministry had been cut short. His ministry only lasted about a year uh, as such. Verse 19, and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. And, and she went, uh, I'm sure, day after day, and especially whenever Herod would pull John out of the prison to hear him preach. It was, it was convicting to Herod. The scripture kind of leads us in that direction. But it also said that, that Herod was glad to hear John. And so for whatever reason, this, this, this anointing of John had a hook into Herod. And he didn't want to kill him. But Herodias, I'm sure every time Herod pulled John out of the prison, she would just probably bite a nail in, in half. She had such a grudge and she had, she had such a vindictive heart. Now let me say this. You know, 
Herod saw this woman. He was enamored with her. They concocted this scheme. They got married, and then I'm sure Herod found out what kind of woman she really was whenever they got married. You know, Herod was wicked. Herodias was more wicked. She was just hateful wicked. If there is such a thing as hateful wickedness, she was. And so John found found um, this, this relationship with Herod, and, and Herod feared John. Uh, verse 20 says that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe, but yet he heard him gladly. He listened to him gladly. And you would think that John would have been afraid of, of Herod. Uh, most people would, but, but it was kind of reversed. Herod was a little afraid of John, and the reason is the Scripture says is because John was a righteous and holy man. He was a godly man, and he, he spoke with authority. He spoke the truth with authority, and that's why he was a little afraid of John. And so the problem here is not necessarily uh, Herod and his relationship with John. The problem here is Herodias and her relationship with Herod. She wanted John killed, and Herod said no. I would have been to, uh, afraid to go to bed with Herodias, actually. You know, you never know what she would pull out in the middle of the night, a viper or something, and throw in the bed, you know. I don't, I don't know, but she was a mean woman. And then John's world changes in a quick moment. In verse, verses 21 through the very first part of verse 24, it said, But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? Secular historians tell us that Herod's daughter's name was Salome. Salome. And Salome danced for Herod to celebrate his birthday. It's a feast. And you have all of these dignitaries sitting around there. You have the, the nobles, and you have the military commanders, and you have uh, the great leaders of Galilee all sitting around there, and they're feasting and eating, and I'm sure they're consuming large amounts of wine and those kinds of things. And then out comes his daughter, Herodias' daughter, to dance and she does this dance that obviously pleases Herod and you can just imagine what kind of dance it was. No, don't do that. Don't go there. Erase that. Back that up. Uh, let's, let's not do that. Just, just take it um, at, at the scripture and says that it pleased Herod and Herod made this oath to her in front of all these people. And so she goes to her mother, and says, uh, for what should I ask? For Herodias, this was a no-brainer. She knew what to ask for. And she said, go back and ask Herod for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So immediately, this is the immediacy of, of, of the events that happened. Immediately she goes back to Herod and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter at once. In other words, go do it now. And you ask yourself the question, why, I wonder, all of the immediacy. And I think Herodias knew that if, if Herod put it off overnight, that he'd come up with some way to keep John alive. And so, having given this oath, it was the only thing he could do. Verse 27, and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Gave it to her mother. Now, one thing that I found interesting is that in verse 26, we see that Herod was very, very sorry. And yet because he had given this oath, and because of those sitting around him, all of the dignitaries, he couldn't refuse his daughter's request. 
And so in verse 27 and 28, the most horrible death to John the Baptist, this, this greatest of the great, was that his head was removed from his body and given to this girl and her mother on a platter. So Herodias finally has her revenge on John the Baptist. Verse 29, when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, we went from seeing crowds of thousands and thousands of people following after Jesus. Then we saw Jesus rejected in his own hometown by his own family even. And then Jesus sends out his disciples two by two and he tells them, look, you're going to be rejected because not everybody is going to receive the gospel. But some will. and Stay there with them until it's time for you to leave and go someplace else. And if, if you go into a place and they don't receive you, then just shake the dust off your feet. Let that be it and go on to the next place. And then we have this section about the death of John the Baptist. The next section coming up, Jesus feeds over 5,000 people. And so if you're like me, you read through that and you say, why did Mark just drop this on us out of nowhere? Well, this section is the only section in the book of Mark that isn't completely centered around Jesus Christ, which even makes it a little bit more odd why Mark would drop this right in the middle of all that we have been going through. And so I think there are two things that we need to focus on with regard to this. Backing up just a little bit, Jesus said to his disciples as he sent them out two by two, you're going to be rejected. I want you to be totally, completely reliant on me. As you read through the New Testament, you find that the apostles suffered, suffered greatly because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Horrible deaths, beatings, imprisonment, all kinds of things. And so I think Mark here is wanting us to slow down just a little bit and, and realize that discipleship is dangerous. Being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ is, is a costly calling. John the Baptist was killed because of his boldness, because of boldly proclaiming truth. Regardless of who it was, it didn't matter to him. Regardless of who it was, he proclaimed truth. And he was killed because of it. The apostles and other disciples boldly went forward and proclaimed the gospel. They proclaimed the truth as given power by the Holy Spirit in their lives and their ministries. And they were persecuted. It's costly. Discipleship is costly and it can be dangerous. And so what does that mean for us? That means as we go into this community, as small as this community is, we're going to find people who are going to reject us. We're going to run into people who are going to persecute us. We already have. People are not going to like us because we speak the truth. And we're going to speak it with authority. We're going to say to people that Jesus is the only way. There is no other way to eternity to spend with God other than through Jesus Christ. And they're not going to like that. And by the way that we live our lives as righteous 
and holy people. They're going to judge us, and they're going to slander us, and they're going to do all kinds of things to us. But by God's grace and his mercy, he will carry this ministry into this community. That's the first thing. Discipleship is costly and it can be dangerous. The second thing that I want to share with you that I got out of this is, is it's, <laughs> it's worth it all. It's worth it all. There has been nothing in my life that I look back on and can say to you that God didn't know what he was doing. There's a line from an old song many years ago, and Diane will recognize this line very quickly. It goes like this. It'll be worth every mile of the trip. And that's the truth. Regardless of the circumstances of your life, regardless of the events of your life, regardless of what you're going through right now in your life or the next season or the next season or the next season, uh, unless Jesus Christ comes back, whatever it is that you endure, it'll be worth every mile of the trip. I promise you that once you enter heaven's gates, it's going to be blow your mind is going to be better than anything by far I cannot explain to you the vividness of what heaven is going to be like the colors the the the, the smells the aromas the the food the, the the love the fellowship the the longing that we have now will be fulfilled whenever we see Jesus it'll be worth every mile of the trip John the Baptist paved the way for Jesus Christ. And isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Aren't we supposed to pave the way for Jesus Christ? Aren't we supposed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? As Christians, aren't we supposed to point to him as the sovereign God of the universe, sovereign over all things, that's sovereign over everything, sovereign over the, the, the temperature, the weather, disease, it doesn't matter. He is sovereign over everything. As Christians, aren't we supposed to lead people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Yes. We're supposed to be available. God's going to lead people across our path. And whenever we get in our building and open the doors, there are going to be people come in there that you don't know from Adam. Well, you would know that they're not Adam because <laughs> Adam's been a long time gone. But you know what I'm saying. We won't know some of these people. God may send us people from all over. We may have people from Etheridge and Summertown and Lawrenceburg and Waynesboro. And who knows where these people are going to come from. They may not look like us and they may not talk like us. Put the shoe on the other foot. We may not look like them and we may not talk like them. But if God brings them across our path, it is our duty to truthfully, with authority, speak the word of God and live out the gospel in our lives. I'm going to ask Houston and Seth to come on back up as we come to a close. I don't, I don't know what to expect in the days to come. I know this world is in a bad, bad place. It's in bad shape. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it's going to take for things to turn around. I don't think that we will ever experience the normal that we were experiencing. But I'm not worried about it. <laughs> to use the vernacular of today, God's got this. He's got all of it. 
And I'm just along for the ride. You know why? Because it will be worth every mile of the trip. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word that you've given us. Thank you for opening our hearts and for understanding that we have a total and complete reliance on you. I know more today than yesterday that I cannot do anything without you. I cannot face today or tomorrow without you. And right now, Father God, I give you praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving in all things, in all things, in all things. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes I, I, I just break down and cry. But sometimes I smile and sometimes my heart is full. And it's all because of you. And I know this one thing I know because I know that you are sovereign. And I know because I know that everything that we go through will be worth every mile of the trip whenever we get to heaven. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.